Um, thank you. <laughs> no one else is like, wait, wait, what's going on? Um, so I'm Jessica. Hi. Hi, Jessica. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I want to be very respectful of your time because I know you have other classes and work responsibilities and other things going on. And so uh, the plan for today is to talk about uh, bullying, but also I would say elements of social justice and how social justice is different than just diversity work. I kind of bring all three of those together. Um, I promise I will be done by 1.30 if you need to leave. Um, I will also stick around in the room a little bit. If you have any questions or anything like that, we can talk one-on-one -on -one if you do have time. Um, one of the things I do at the beginning of all of my workshops is I ask everyone to take out their cell phones. Um, so go ahead, take out your cell phones. Um, one of the things I think is really interesting is that I go to trainings and the presenters ask everyone to turn their cell phones off, which I think is like going to make people break out into hives. So don't turn your cell phone off. I'm actually going to give you my cell phone number so that as you're going along, you're probably going to have questions or comments or thoughts or maybe if I'm remotely <coughs> effective, that might happen later today or tomorrow or next week or something. And so I want you to be able to send me a text message because sometimes doing this work, we don't have anyone that we feel safe asking questions to and we turn our little editor on because we want to make sure that our question is a good question, but it's a question. And so if I can pretend to answer it or give you some resource that can answer it or we can engage in a dialogue, I think that's actually doing good work. Um, so if you have your phones out, oh, oh, and I have a scribe, Dr. Scribe, thank you very much. Um, so it's 917. Go Brooklyn. Hoot, hoot. Uh, five four three zero nine six six. Um, my insurance agent usually tells me to make sure to tell you text messaging rates do apply. I have an unlimited plan, so don't worry about me. But um, you are welcome to text message me anytime about anything. Sounds great. Um, I used to work in student affairs, and so some ways this is really how I maintain kind of conversations with students as I travel around the country. Um, I was actually out of television and radio range, yet I still had cell phone range, which was interesting. And um, somebody text messaged me when the BP oil spill happened and asked me like, oh, what do you think? Like, what's going on? And who do you think is responsible, et cetera? And I had no idea what they were talking about because I hadn't listened to the radio or watched the news and no one had text messaged me yet. So I'm kind of dependent on people who have my cell phone number, which are thousands and thousands of people now. Um, can also do Facebook, whatever you want. So I am your pocket social justice person who pretends to know what they're talking about. Um, with that said, I think it's also important to mention that when we're going to talk about bullying, I think something very similar happens is when we talk about diversity. And what I mean by that is, is that we approach diversity and bullying as if something is external to us. Like if I walk over here, from this place, I can understand bullying, right? But then I like flash back to reality and then bullying stays somewhere over there. But diversity is the same thing, that sometimes we think we take a diversity class or we go to a diversity program or something like that and so that it's external to us that we study it or observe it or function through it, and then we come back to reality. What I think is interesting is, is that reality is oddly real. And so like, your life doesn't start at graduation or when you get married or when you buy a house or when you adopt a pet, like it's actually happening right now. This isn't television, this is your life, welcome. For some people that's obvious, for other people it's like, no, I thought I had to do this and this and this and this and then my life starts. But um, that's actually not true. You're, you're actually functioning and alive right now. So what I encourage us to do is to really be able to kind of pull the conversation into us. So in doing that, generally people can get freaked out because they're like, wow, what am I going to have to share? I don't want to share. It's not that kind of thing. Because I think sometimes diversity trainings have done a lot of harm and they freak people out. And so... I also should tell you it's not my goal to make anyone cry in an hour, it's not a lot of time. Um, I also think it's important to state that white straight men, I don't think it's your fault. <laughs> what? Like that's weird. So for sometimes that's like welcome to the conversation for the first time. Um, but I think a lot of white women specifically have pointed our fingers at white straight men waiting for them to change so that we don't actually have to claim any kind of responsibility 
when it comes to actual power and privilege. Um, I also do not play any musical instruments, so we will not be singing kumbaya or playing guitar or anything like that at all. What is interesting in this particular setting with time being limited is that I, I think it's important that I could go into kind of like what I notice about bullying behaviors, how bystander behavior and interrupting bullying behaviors, even naming bullying behaviors. Um, I could talk about that and y'all could sit there and listen to me because that's what we do at school is it's super academic. But what I want to challenge us is that instead of doing that, I'm actually going to ask you to like get in your own head, right? So we can engage in more conversation as you text me. So what I want to do is I want to lead us through a fairly quick kind of interactive activity. For those of you that need to know what's going on and what the plan is, the interactive piece is probably going to be about 10 minutes long. And then I'm going to say freeze. And when I say freeze, what I'm going to ask you to do is to be silent. And I want you to pay attention to the voices in your head. Now, that statement is very confusing to a lot of people for two reasons. Number one, extroverts. Silent means don't talk out loud, just to be clear. Introverts, enjoy the silence. <laughs> voices in your head seems to be the other piece that really like, what are you talking about? So right now when I say the voices in your head, if your head is going, I don't have a voice in my head, what is she talking about? That is the voice in your head, right? Because mm -hmm. you didn't say that out loud. And the reason why it's important to understand the voice in your head is that that's where a lot of judgments and assumptions happen. And then it's the actions that are applied to the judgments and assumptions that I think we really need to look at when we start reflecting on social justice, bullying, hate crimes, things like this. What's important to understand about interrupting bullying is that on the nano level, it's a hell of a lot easier to interrupt, but we think it's so minute that it's not interruptible. Like it's just, you know, it's just a flyer or it's just a name. It's not that big a deal. But at the bottom of that pyramid are these things that are very easy to interrupt. At the top of it are things like genocide, right? When it gets all the way up to genocide, it's also very hard to interrupt. But somebody somewhere probably wishes somebody had interrupted earlier. Do you see how that works? Mm -hmm. When we talk about hate crimes or we talk about bias-related incidents, it's also important to understand that Hate crimes is a crime, which means something illegal occurred, and it was targeted based on a hate, or a, based on hate or some kind of predisposed assumption about a particular group. That's a hate crime. But that's not necessarily what you have to wait for either to interrupt it, right? You don't have to wait for something illegal to happen, like harassment or damage to property or something like that. When we talk about a bias-related incident, it might not be illegal but it's probably against the norm. It's probably against the community standard that you've set up here on campus or in your home or within your friends. If you think about your friends and you're hanging out and you're having a good time and one of your friends does or says something and you're like, dude, that's totally not cool. Whatever that dude, that's totally not cool thing is, that's literally interrupting behavior that might not be illegal. It's just not cool. Do you see how the difference there is? So with that kind of framework, I want you to kind of pay attention to what happens already in your head. So when we do this activity, it's going to be interactive for about 10 minutes, and then for about 15 minutes, really, really fast, I'm going to go through all the variables of the activity and invite you to have a conversation with the voices in your head. Because if you don't pay attention to them, and I think a lot of systems of oppression teach us that we're not supposed to even acknowledge that we have voices in our head. But if you can pay attention to where those voices are and what they're saying, then you can actually, one, I think, join the human race, because usually our voices are all saying the same thing. We just pretend they're not. And you can then be more self-aware of how you actually show up and how that might manifest itself in a way that you are bullying someone else or perhaps damage because you have been bullied. One thing that's interesting, I think, about bullying behaviors is one in 10 people, one in 10, have never been bullied in their life. That means nine in 10 people have. So if we want to talk about bullying in this external way, note that in this room, statistically speaking, two and a half of you have not experienced any kind of harassment or bullying. 
This is an internal, real thing that we need to talk about, and I think the best way to interrupt bullying and to stop bullying is to start with yourself and understand what's going on in here. Does that sound good? Yes. Semi-fun way to spend the next 45 minutes? Yes. Rock out. Okay, so this is the hardest part of the activity because it involves you moving and making small groups. So after that part, it's super easy. People will also be coming and going, so that's totally fine. So what I'd like for you to do is relatively quickly, the chairs are not bolted to the ground, I believe, but you are allowed to make small cluster groups. Let's shoot for like five, six people per group. <coughs> Mix it up. And then if people have to come and go, that's fine. So I'm going to turn around, I'm going to turn back around, and you're going to poof, be in magic groups. <laughs> Sound good? When you are in magic groups, you then need to send one person to me so I can give you the instructions and you can go sit back down. Good? Okay, three, two, one. Make you all can, are you all participating, right? Participating? Okay. One person, come to me. I am not going to trick you or do anything weird. We'll meet. Ah. I have to wait for everybody so I can give you your special directions. One person from each group, come on up here so I can give you the directions. I told you this is the hardest part. One person per group. Hollister, sweatshirt, are you in a group? Y'all, are y'all in a group? Are there only four of you? Fantastic, okay, good. Everybody else believes they are in a group? Yes. Yes, okay, so hold on one second. All you out here, just so you know, if more people come in, that is awesome. Randomly sort out which group they're in and then catch them up to speed. Sound good? Are you in a group? Yeah. Okay, great. So you guys, so they're going to think I'm going to tell you some kind of secret thing, which I'm not. Notice, full volume. Here is a packet of paper. It shifts around sometimes when I travel. So make sure there are 14 little slips of paper in it. If there are, go back to your group and don't show it to anybody. If there aren't, I'll give you a new packet. Okay. 14. 14. Are you joining a group? Oh, I'm just waiting. Okay. Y'all are expecting me to be very dehydrated. <laughs> You're good? Okay, then just go back to your group. Don't show it to anybody. Excellent. Just go on back to your group and don't show it to anybody. Take it. Yep, take it with you. And then at one point, I'm going to say, I'm going to tell you something I'm not going to repeat. That part usually makes people have heart attacks, so I'll warn you when it's coming, okay? So what you're going to do is you're going to work only with your group. You can't ask any clarifying questions of me. I usually like to warn people that I was a stand-up comedian in New York, so if you ask me questions, I get to heckle you. <laughs> <laughs> so I would advise against that. Um, you cannot collaborate with other group members. And then when I say freeze... It means stop. I used to say stop, but people would have heart attacks and cheat. So if I say freeze, you're still going to cheat. That's fine, but there's less heart attacks. I don't have that much insurance. Make sense? OK, so I'm going to say freeze. When I say freeze, I'm going to go through all the variables, and you're literally having a conversation with the voices in your head. One, it's like get out of being a jerk free card, because you don't have to say anything out loud. I will share with you some of the stupid things people have said out loud, which is more motivation for you to be very silent. Then I will say break, and then we will open it up. Then you'll talk about how you're doing, what's going on in your head, and then we can talk about the activity. But what I would really prefer to do is talk about really what happens in your head, because we don't actually spend a lot of time paying attention to what's going on in here. Sound good? OK, are you all a party of two? Yeah, yeah. we don't have nobody to us. Okay, why don't you all join a group? Because you can't do the activity by yourself. So here, I'll take your packet. Make friends. It's good. Get a tetanus shot, whatever you need to do, but join a group. Bye. So, here are, y'all can like back your chairs up and let them in. That would also be really nice of you. You could spin your chairs so you can make eye contact with your group members. Also a very nice move. Excellent job. Okay, so this is what you're going to do. Here are the directions that I am not going to repeat. 
I will repeat that part. Here are the directions that I am not going to repeat. Are you ready? Yes. Thank you. So, I am the mayor. Hello. Your group is the mayor's council. There is a storm. Ooh. There are 14 people stuck on a roof. Ah. Do you have a boat that holds 10 people? Figure out a solution. You may begin. So, those of you with packets, open, oh, thank you. share. Good job. faster than I thought, and so you have 30 seconds to finish your decision. this particular activity because very rarely do we ever spend time inside of our own head. We typically approach these kind of conversations external to ourselves and I think that's why that we're still having the conversation, right, is that we're, we're waiting for some FedEx package to arrive with a solution but it's actually all existing already within us. So what I want to do is I'm going to first review the directions then I'm going to go through all 14 people and I'm going to tell you what I typically hear. That doesn't mean that any of you actually said it, but what I think is interesting is I've done this activity over 6,000 times and whether you are a CEO of a Fortune 500 company or a fifth grader, 
generally the same things come up. And the reason why I think that's really important to state is that we've created all of these different categories so that we think that people are very, very different than us. But what's interesting is, is that the stuff that's in our head is very, very similar. For some of us, you might have friends that have the need for filters, right? I have a friend that I always think, for your birthday, I'm buying you a filter. Because what they say, I kind of wish they wouldn't say out loud. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. A lot of us, I'm even that person sometimes, say things out loud that I don't really should say out loud. But I say it in my head. And really the great equalizer is that we all say the same thing in our heads. Regardless of class, race, religion, region of the country, access to education, citizenship. I even did this activity when I was in the Peace Corps in Bulgaria and the same things happen. Which is some commentary on colonialization and Western expansion, but that's a different workshop. Okay, so directions were 14 people on a roof, you have a boat that holds 10, figure it out. So to clarify, I never said anybody was going to die. But generally, people create Armageddon. This is the end of the universe. So we have to pick the best 10 people to live. What's interesting about that is it's a great metaphor for privilege. Because as a mayor's council, generally, you're not involved in the great rescue. As the mayor, I've displaced responsibility onto you. And you're solving this problem from some kind of hovercraft. Because it's the end of civilization for these 14 people. But we're good. We're all good. That's how privilege works is that we're all comfy and good, and we do an inventory, and we decide this is an expendable resource, but we can't just give this to everybody. So we have to pick who really deserves it. That's how privilege works. So I did not say anybody was going to die. Generally, that's what occurs. So the processes in which people tend to solve these problems, I think, is also fascinating. Because I don't remember learning this stuff in school, and I'm one of those progressive liberals, right? So like this should have been in a class. And I don't remember being in a class, but everybody does exactly the same thing. So the first line of conversation is what I call morally good and morally bad. Who is a good person and who is a bad person? Who has a long life to live? Who's already lived a long life? Obviously, we do not know all of that information. But based on our personal experiences, we write stories about the people and guess. That usually gets interrupted with what I call the weakest link which by nature is sexist, ableist, and ageist, because it's women, children, and medical needs. Even when the Titanic was going down, able-bodied men with no children made it on the life rafts. Sometimes we call that leadership or charisma. I would think brute force might also have come up, right? But weakest link is kind of number two. Number three is what I call the pageant method. These are the counselor, social worker, psychology major types, because they're like, we should like ask for volunteers or maybe we should have focus groups and people could really decide it out and really talk and figure it out. So that person's usually like, shut up, we got to kill poor people. That's usually what happens. Interesting. That's the same person when I say the emergency announcement and you have 30 seconds to finish. The touchy-feely pageant method, let's gather more information, is usually the person who's like, oh my gosh, we have to finish, kill poor people. I think there's a lot of stress in those fields. So um, after that, after the pageant method, we then have the creative outside of the box thinkers. These are the people who had people dangling from the boat or swimming rotational systems or helicopters, things like this have used. Rope ladders have been used. Creative outside of the box thinkers are also usually silenced because their ideas seem ridiculous. But I'd like to point out they are within the rules. They are just generally silenced because we like to kill people. Which is fascinating to watch as well. And then last but not least is what I call the semi-blind justice. Semi-blind justice, and what I mean by that is, is that you've already read all the information about the 14 people, so it's not completely blind. So whatever positive or negative bias you're applying to the 14 people kind of gets applied. And then if you flip them over or fold them in half or whatever, you're going to randomly pick 10, but it's way faster to kill four people. So you'll randomly pick four. But the pregnant black woman might not make it in that way. So usually you put her in the boat, and then you randomly pick from 13. That's what happens. Some combination of that probably occurred in your group. And the reason why I think that's important is, is that we never learned that that's how you solve this. I worked in student affairs for 10 years in risk management. I am really good at a crisis. And I do not remember this pamphlet. 
but it is kind of what generally pops up into how to solve these problems. I think that as a social justice educator, it's good for me to see those patterns and they're just affirmed over and over and over again. More patterns that are affirmed are the positive and negative biases that come up when you're going through the 14 people. So I'm gonna go through them super fast, but I, wanted, I want you to know that you need to have the opportunity to find out what positive and negative bias you applied. Generally, it's a personal identity, someone in your family or friends or a neighbor or a movie or something like that. I don't know where it comes from, doesn't matter, it's floating in your head. And we work really, really hard to pretend that we don't know it's floating in our head. But it's in there. We just pretend that we don't think it is. Because we try not to act on it. But what happens is, is that we unintentionally act on it. We obliviously act on it. Or we know that we're acting on it. And sometimes the impact of that can be really painful for someone else. But if we don't know where we're coming from, we can't monitor or adjust any of those actions or behaviors. Do you see how that works? Okay, so I'm going to go through the 14 people. This is the silent in your head part, and it's really hard for extroverts to be silent, and you will get gold stars that are worth nothing if you are silent this whole time. Okay, good job. So number one, let's start with the pregnant black woman. Pregnant black woman almost always makes it in the boat, but she does not make it in the boat because she is fertile or for diversity, so we have melanin in the future of civilization. No, she makes it in the boat because she is a human coupon. It is two for one. Is the only time anybody is willing to break a rule ever. It's like, shh, don't tell anybody, but shit, don't people buy. Right? That's what happens. It immediately segues, interestingly enough, to the conversation about the 330 pound person who could also be pregnant. Shit, I didn't think about that, right? 330 pound person, most people picture a white obese man. <laughs> when I do a really large group, I give people handouts so they can write on it, and people will write that this person has no will to live, because that's not judgmental at all, right? Depending on if you, how many engineering classes or something somebody's taken, sometimes they put the 330-pound person in the center of the boat because he'll stabilize the boat during giant waves. <laughs> Also, this person has been declared very buoyant, so they could just float alongside of the boat. What's fascinating is that my father was a professional bodybuilder. At the peak of his career, he weighed over 400 pounds. I also used to weigh over 400 pounds. You may not know this, but this is the Paris Hilton version of me. But his 400 pounds socially means something different than mine. He could pick up heavy stuff. That would be important in a crisis. I eat heavy stuff, so keep the cheesecake away, right? <laughs> but it's the same weight. But in our heads, it's circumference and space, like Southwest Airlines. They Do they count as two people? Well, we can't bring them in. But the pregnant black woman counted as two people, and that was fine, OK? Then we have the illegal alien. What's fun for me in this particular position is that I get to go through this, and I, one of many soapboxes that you're about to hear is around the term illegal alien, and that this is a pejorative term, and we need to stop using this term. Illegal means that someone is breaking the law that was written by someone who is not impacted by that law at all. An alien is like E.T. That's really not what we're talking about here. For illegal aliens, they almost never make it in the boat because they can swim. Notice that. Right around now, you're like, oh, crap, I just laughed out loud. Shit, I shouldn't do that, right? What's interesting, though, is, is that I could be in Arizona. I could be in Southern California. I could be anywhere in the United States. And that's what people end up saying. Oh, they can swim. Who cares? So while you're in your heads, pull up Google Maps really quick, OK? Shimmy the map over. You'll notice that our bias around illegal aliens is that they're swimming up the Mojave and the Sonoran Desert. If that really was the case, and they were swimming through deserts and then stealing all of our jobs because they're so lazy, Michael Phelps would not be that big a deal. One, he's cheating. He swims in water, way easier than a desert. And the truth is, more undocumented people come in from Canada than Mexico every single day. But who is threatened by a Canadian? We don't even think about brown people living in Canada. Of course, that happens. And white people live in Mexico, too. But we don't think about that either. What's interesting is, is that the assumptions that are in our head around immigration issues and race relations and things like that are in here whether we know it or not. And some of us don't even know what we actually believe and the stuff is still in our heads. 
That's why I invite you to be quiet so that you can kind of analyze what's going on in here. Then we have the 15-year-old committed twice for robbery. Ask yourself, inside voice, if you pictured a man or a woman, and an innocent man or an innocent woman, a white man or woman, or a not white man or woman. I've noticed that if you have teenage children, there's actually been a pattern where you picture your own children. Otherwise, people picture somebody else who they have some kind of experience with that's generally negative. In my own head, if this person was stealing Sudafed because their grandmother's Medicaid ran out, I would save them. If they were stealing Sudafed to make meth, I would have no problem killing them. That's really important for me to know, especially because I often work with 15-year-olds. And the reality is, is the 15-year-olds have already figured out that I have a bias around meth use. Do you see how that works? They're never going to talk to me about meth use, even if I say, you can talk to me about drugs, it's fine. There's a negative bias I have specific to meth. They're going to pick up on that because of my actions long before I become conscious of it. That's why it's important to pay attention in here. The real tragedy is that I'm actually a recovering alcoholic and drug addict, and it would be wonderful to have a conversation with a 15-year-old. I just still have some negative bias around certain drugs but they might not get through that complication. The welfare recipient for 15 years, most people picture a woman with lots and lots of children. Usually if they're writing, they'll say that this person's a drain on the government, get an effing job. So I do my brother's taxes. My brother is the one in the family who turned out right. So he goes to church on Sundays, he's married, he has two kids, he has a house with a picket fence and a dog. Like, all good. I'm the other one. But what's interesting is, is that he and his wife both have two jobs, full-time jobs and the part-time jobs in the evening. They have two children. I did their taxes and their joint income for 2009, I have not done 2010 yet. For 2009, their joint income was $18,000. I spend $18,000 a semester on airplane tickets. They're joint, they're raising two children on $18,000 and according to the state of Ohio, that's $3,000 too much to qualify for any state assistance. Most of us don't know what poverty really looks like. What's interesting is I've noticed in the last couple of years, it's becoming more and more common someone in the audience does, and they're surrounded by people who don't. And I think within higher ed, that's something we really need to be conscious of, is that there's significant class disparity that's coming into our campuses that our textbooks didn't tell us about. So we need to pay attention. We have the feminist. Generally, it depends how much I walk around the room, but somebody usually says, you better put her on the boat or she's going to get you. Like, I'm going to bite you if you do or don't put the feminist on. What's interesting, I think, is, is as more and more people study women's studies and there's more women's study centers <coughs> and we're like in the fourth wave of the feminist movement, rarely, if ever, is the feminist declared in your head a man. It's still a woman in your head. So usually someone's like, well, a man feminist, what does that even look like? Well, while you're in there, what does a female dentist look like? Because that happens too. It's just not the card we have on file. I don't think we're making a lot of progress in the feminist movement until it is possible to picture a male feminist. And there are lots of them. One of them is president of the United States right now. Then we have the epileptic. I have been asked around this time, some of the extroverts generally vibrate. So I have been asked if the epileptic means they're gay. For the record, no, they are not mutually exclusive. Depending on your cable package, you might know that the epileptic has seizures, and so then they might or might not get saved for medical attention. Um, what's particularly interesting is I think this is how tokenization works, because my best friend is epileptic. We all have our collection of friends, right? I have an epileptic friend. So I called my epileptic friend and said, hey, Owen, here's the situation. What would you do? And Owen was like, well, I'd probably just go back in the stairs. What? What are you talking about? Roof, boat, what stairs? And he's like, well, how'd I get on the roof? And he assumes there's no roof on the boat and they're already on the roof of the building, so they came up the stairwell, and that he's assuming there's lightning in the storm and it would trigger a seizure. So now I know if I'm ever in the situation and I come in contact with this epileptic, I'm just gonna throw them all in the stairwell, because that's what Owen said to do. As ridiculous as that is, we often tokenize people all the time based on the one we've met, and then we assume they're all the same. That's not the case. The drag queen usually gets tabled for later. 
So the conversation sometimes is around entertainment. Who needs a good round of I will survive? People on the boat or people on the roof? I don't know. Let's figure that one out later. Then they get tabled. The Jehovah's Witness usually gets confused with uh, Hare Krishna. I hear things about tambourines and 6 a.m. or maybe the watchtower or something. But um, the Jehovah's Witness and the Hasidic Jew usually come up together. And there is an assumption that the Jehovah's Witness and the Hasidic Jew are going to be arguing. So we should just leave them on the roof and they can work it out. And maybe we can leave the feminist up there and then she could mediate that conversation. And then when they're all done, they could have some kind of quinoa salad or something. That's what usually happens. Most people don't know what a Hasidic Jew is, so they just have no problem killing them. Or I have been told that the Hasidic Jew and the Jehovah's Witness have a deep affection and relationship with Jesus Christ, so they are ready to die. For the record, the, Je the Jehovah's Witness, maybe, probably not the Hasidic Jew, though. But nice try. So then we have the person disfigured by fire. What's particularly fascinating about this one, I think, is that most people picture a white person with a facial scar. So usually they even pet their face so I can tell when the groups are there. It's probably important to mention at some point something that is called the white imagination. And that is, unless you are otherwise told, regardless of your own racial identity, you tend to picture white people in your head because that's how white supremacy works. So a person disfigured by fire is a facial scar. Sometimes they get put on the boat for medical attention. Scars don't need medical attention. If any of you have scars, they're kind of good. They don't need medical attention. But then some people will clarify that, no, 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 no. They've been through so much, they need therapy. So nine people are experiencing Armageddon and one person is waiting for a shrink. That's how that logic works, which doesn't really work. So then we have the Korean market owner. This is particularly fun with grammar. What people tend to picture is a Korean man who owns a store of some sort. Of course it has to be a man because like a woman could possibly own their own business. Pshaw. And because they're Korean, they're good at business and math. So we should just pair them up with the person carrying life savings because then the free market economy can work. So one, the person carrying life savings is like Santa Claus walking down the street with a big bag of money, which unless you're Glenn Beck, after Armageddon would have no value because it's all paper. It's not actually a bag of gold. Okay, one. Two, women can own their own businesses. And three, pay attention to what happens in your head. I think this is fascinating. So we picture a Korean market owner. But what if it's someone who owns a market that sells Korean stuff? And that the Korean part is the descriptor of the store and not the person? All of a sudden it becomes like a dollar general. Like, why would you say that? It's a bunch of plastic crap. We don't assess business skills, math skills, entrepreneurship, innovation, anything like that at all. It just becomes a dollar store. Person carrying life savings also generally is greedy or some kind of Santa Claus image going on. We don't picture a homeless person, a child, right? Or I'm 36 years old. When I turned 30, I heard grownups had savings accounts, so I started a savings account. And due to online bank account transfers, I generally have about five bucks in my savings account. That would be my life savings. Is that what you pictured? Generally, no. That's not at all what any of us picture, including me. Then last but not least, we have the HIV positive person who continues to have sex. Sometimes, if this even gets talked about, the, you, the word murderer comes up a lot. And what we picture is some gay nymphomaniac man who's going to go around poking everybody. And this is a crisis. We do not have time for this. Sometimes they get on the boat for medical treatment. But what's interesting is, is that we generally have a very hard time having conversations about consensual sex, protected sex. This person's responsible enough to know their status. Nobody else on the list knows their status. But there's so much negative bias around HIV positive status people that literally the responsibility of knowing their own status, we would kill them. They're dying anyway. I hear that all the time. We're all actually dying. That's the fun way. As soon as you're born, you could think about you've immediately started dying. It's kind of a weird way to live your life, but maybe you could live it differently. But what's interesting is, is that when I do this, even in an LGBT setting, so my whole audience is lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, or allies. They still don't save this person because there's still a negative bias that it's a gay disease. So if we kill them all off, then people who are HIV negative, at least currently, 
won't have the stigma of the HIV disease. I think it's really interesting that most people working or studying on any college campus in the country were not alive during a period where HIV was not a norm. <coughs> but yet it still has this negative bias. We perpetuate that negative bias. It's up to us to stop doing that. I would think welfare and HIV positive status are probably, and I would say immigration status, are probably the three most marginalized and silenced voices on our campuses right now. I would also, on some campuses, I would throw in conservative and Christian as well. There's not a lot of freedom there to talk about those identities either on some campuses. So that is a very quick review of the list. But if I don't go through the whole list, then we end up talking just about the activity. So what I invite you to do is two things at this point. One is put all the little slips back into the boats, and I'll come around and pick them up. And two, for the next 15 minutes, what I invite us to do is not talk about the activity. The reason why is this is paper. I made it up, right? What I would prefer us to do is have a conversation about what happened in our heads while I was going through telling you what typically happened in your head. The reason why I know what happened in your head is because we are all very, very, very similar. And we have all been exposed to the same positive and negative biases, except for you know individual experiences. And then those can be really powerful. So what I would prefer to do with the next 15 minutes is to talk about what's going on in here, because that's really the end of bullying, the end of racism, the end of sexism, the end of classism. That's in here. You already have those skills. You just didn't know it because you don't listen to the voice. And when I say you, please know I am included in that as well. So you may now speak. How are you doing? Congratulations. You've been quiet for like 20 minutes. Give yourself a round of applause. Yay. For some people, that is a big deal. So, so what happened in your head? How are you doing? Yes. Well, I was in total denial for almost the whole time until you said we have how many seconds left to do this because... Then you immediately launched into killing people? <laughs> well, no, but throwing people. Okay. <laughs> saving people, like save as many as we can. Okay. But I mean, the, it's an impossible decision because I get into the touchy-feely stuff. Well, we don't know enough about these right. people. Okay. And, it's, and in a sense, it doesn't matter whether we know much about them or not. It's like every single one of those people have qualities that are important right. for that vote. And the more information oh, you know, have... The other four could have saved, could have been swimming under the boat and held it up. Oh, man, we forgot about that. Sure. The other thing that's important to note is that the more information you have, the harder the decision is. So, I mean, like, I invite you to think about, like, financial aid officers. Right? Like they try to get as little information as possible about the person's story or as much as possible, depending on the campus, so that they can make a clear decision. And when I do consulting work for, with financial aid offices, one of the first things I invite them to do is to look over the last 10 years and find out what kind of student actually gets aid. Because every system is exquisitely designed to produce the results that it gets. What biases, positive or negative, exist currently and that's, those are the biases that are helping you issue financial aid, right? Because the more information you have, the harder it's going to be. The less information you have, it might feel better. But in some ways, that's kind of displacing responsibility, like the mayor. Y'all are making these decisions. So it, there's a fine balance there, and you can't know. And we make all these decisions all the time. Y'all made these decisions when you walked into this room and decided who to sit next to. When you decide which kind of car to park next to. It's, we think diversity trainings have taught us that judgments and assumptions are bad, you, that you should just wait until you are judgment and assumption free. Watch this. This is fun. What happens when you assume? Perhaps out of you, I go wrong. Right. They go wrong, and the, the song is that you make an ass out of you and me. So we just sit back and wait to be cleansed of this problem. But the truth is, is that we do them because we're right. We make judgments and assumptions, and when we're wrong, we seek more information to get right. Or we make judgments and assumptions to be safe and to feel prepared. When I got out of my rental car, I sat in the car and debated, do I leave my jacket on, do I take my jacket off? Because I have, P.S., a very large tattoo. I have two small tattoos, but really get trumped by the big one. 
Is this school okay for me to fly a tattoo? From a parking lot, I have to make that decision. I have no idea if I chose well or not. I decided to take my jacket off because I'm hot. That's how that works. <laughs> but some schools, it would be a deal breaker if I walked into the room like this. I have to figure that out really quickly. Judgments and assumptions happen. There's no value judgment of them. They just occur. Anyway, no more school boxes. Go ahead. Um, I, our group, after a little bit of discussion, decided to do that last effort that you talked right. about where you just fold them in half, you don't look at them, and we'll see which four you know, are outside the boat and the 10 that are inside the boat. And I actually appreciated the opportunity to do that because it allowed me to not be judgmental. It allowed me to just um, approach it in a more equitable way. Okay. Without hearing stories and backgrounds and those kind of things, and then I didn't have to go into that judgment, judgmental role of who was worth saving and who was not. So my language, and to take it a little bit out of the activity, but my guess is, is it probably felt cleaner yes. for you. So what I would challenge you to do is think about other, like when you opened them up and saw who was in or who right. was, wasn't in, and I actually, y'all stopped before you even opened who was in the boat, just so y'all know. But would there have been someone who got killed that you would have been mad about getting killed? Or would there have been someone who got saved that you got mad because they got saved? Like that's only a conversation you can have with yourself, right? And chances are, yes, because there's going to be a really strong bias somewhere in one of the 14, at least one, if not many of them. So yes? I think everybody had their own opinion, but for my feeling, Mm -hmm. The first thing is thinking about what is right and what is benefit of the whole group. Okay. So I try to say that person, like you say the black woman with pregnant, there's two life in one person. Coupon, right. Yeah. So you said that one and, and the children, they cannot help themselves. Children or women is weaker than a guy. So we're going to say that children and women and a woman that pregnant first because there's going to benefit and they are reproductive. Okay. And then next person I'm going to say is a guy that's a strong man. They can be a leader or can be your next productive. Okay, so, so then to pull that out of the activity, because remember mm -hmm. I don't want to talk about the actual activity, you're really logical, right? And like you're yeah. going straight to your head mm -hmm. and you're making a logic-based decision <laughs> based on seven words or less mm -hmm. about the 14 people. You fill in the blanks with your experience. Right? So like, there are some people in the room who are not going to agree with you that men are stronger than women because they know some woman who is stronger than a man or they know some, woman, or some man who is weaker than a woman. Right? Or that you, th we can disagree based on our experiences. Yeah, Wait, no, hold on. The point is, is that you went logical and so you need to know that that's where you made this kind of decision from. If it's a totally different kind of decision, maybe you come from a different place. But for this kind of decision, you went logical. Not good or bad, not right or wrong, you went logical. That's what happened. But I'm thinking about the, the benefit in the long run. Women be able to reproduce, but men can. Then if only have women, you don't choose one of the strong men with the group, you cannot reproduce either. Okay, so See? again, I don't want to talk specifically about the activity, and I could play all kinds of fun games and make that not true, but the important piece is to understand that it's logic. Like, you went straight here. Right? Whereas like other people might go like more heart or emotions or like figuring out like the, the they want the background and the story. Mm -hmm. And then other people, when it hits 30 seconds, they're in action. We gotta solve it. We have to finish. Right? It's paper. Nobody was actually harmed in this activity. But you need to know where you show up in every kind of decision because it fluctuates. Sometimes I'm total softy. Sometimes I'm immediately doing something or I'm totally paralyzed. Sometimes I'm in my head. That's self-reflection and knowing how you show up. So, good. Other thoughts, comments? Yes? I think um, I would just uh, draw the lottery, like pick one basket for people. Okay. So there's no judgment on who decided what. And whoever got picked is not dying, but left behind. Okay. So then, again, y'all are not doing a very good job of this. Out of the activity and into you, your group went random, or luck, or chance, right? Like, and what's interesting about luck is that um, there's, there's a really great research project happening right now that, um, that I'm a part of that talks about if you come from a lower economic background, 
luck plays a bigger role. And if you get out of a lower economic background, you got lucky. Right? <coughs> like it just was lucky. If you come from a higher economic background and you end up in the same place as the person who was from a lower economic background, you're much more likely to say you deserved it or you earned it or you worked for it. It's not luck. But luck can impact both groups of people. It just isn't internalized, which is interesting. But random is also a solution. There, no one's winning. Right? You, you all get gold stars because you were quiet for 20 minutes. Congratulations. But outside of the gold stars that have no actual value, there is no correct answer. What's important is just for you to understand how you approach the decision, because chances are this is how you show up at work. This is how you show up in your relationships. This is how you show up at a grocery store picking a cantaloupe. Right? How do you show up? That's where the answers are. How do you stop bullying? The best way to stop bullying is to stop bullying. It's like quitting smoking. The best way to quit smoking is to stop buying them, taking them out, putting it to your lips, lighting it, and inhaling. Once you stop those things, you have stopped smoking. Best way to stop drinking is to stop drinking. Best way to stop speeding is to stop speeding. You see how that works? But we are expecting this FedEx package to arrive with the answers external to us, but it's actually here. One more thought, comment, question, idea? Okay, that was super duper. Yes, did you have something? I heard no, a smack. I just, you know, uh, in, in looking at that, the, the hardest thing for me to get my head around is, is my judgment is inconsequential. I mean, really, it, it doesn't really matter what I think about those people. Every single one of them has a right to live. Okay. And regardless of who they are. So I think that's why when you said to just fold them, we'll pick four, and those guys stay out, really sat well with me. Cool. So can I nudge that just yep. for fun? So your judgment is inconsequential, right? That's a really important thing to say. It's not inconsequential to them. True. Right? It's inconsequential to you because we are on a hovercraft in our little privileged comfort place solving this problem out here. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So it's really important to understand that what seems completely inconsequential, which it is, right? Like, it's, I mean, this is totally inconsequential. It's paper. It's not even real people mm -hmm. on a roof. Mm -hmm. It's totally inconsequential. But it has an impact on other people. Right? So even the conversations within your group and the group dynamics within your little groups, people said stuff that had an impact on that group. Some of you are at work. Some of you are sitting in a circle with your supervisor. Some of you are sitting with classmates or people you look up to or people you already look down to. Those dynamics are in the room. Those did not come in the plane with me. Right? Whatever your judgments and assumptions are about me when I walked into the room, you brought those. And whatever judgments and assumptions I brought into this room, there's consequences out there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So what ends up happening is we focus on the impact on ourselves, which is the privilege piece, right? Is that we do a resource of what we got, and I deem this expendable. So as long as it doesn't actually impact my inventory I'm keeping, it's inconsequential. But to other people, it's not. You know, like I was just listening to NPR between the airport and here, and the federal government has yet to pick a budget or find a compromise, right? To them, it is inconsequential. They have some larger political thing going on right now, right? To a, a, a caller called in whose daughter is a military wife and a federal employee. Her husband was just deployed a week ago. She has three small children. Neither of them might get a paycheck next week because right now we're actually in the middle of federal pay cycles. They get paid every two weeks. Like, that's not inconsequential, but I don't think Harry Reid or Boehner are thinking about that. They're thinking about something bigger, something larger. Everything we do does have consequences. It's just whether or not they impact us to the degree to which they matter. Right? That's how bullying happens, and we don't even know about it. Mm -hmm. Is the government might shut down by Friday? Do you think it will be affected, the college student or the school? If you have any money coming in from any place, any source that has any federal connection, so your Pell Grant, your financial aid, 
any kind of like housing assistance. Um, and my brother is now going through a divorce. Still the perfect one though. Um, he's going through a divorce and so his uh, paychecks are garnished to pay for food stamps and child support because they can't talk to each other and just do that stuff on their own. Um, so his wife might not be getting food stamps or if he can't get paid, then his wages can't be garnished. So yeah, so there's, everybody. yeah. Back in the 1900s, the last time we played, let's shut down the government and see what happens. Um, I was actually taking a group of students on a work project to Haiti and three fourths of the group couldn't go. So we ended up having to cancel the whole trip because the three fourths of the group didn't get their passports on time. So yeah, it's not just feeding the pandas in the national zoo or national parks. I mean, this is significantly huge, huge, and completely inconsequential because it's just this theoretical thing that's being debated amongst my fellow Democrats and the Republicans, neither of which seem to think this is a very consequential thing, unless you count the impact on their careers. But doesn't mean the college has to shut down too, right? No, no, I don't think this We're state funded. Yeah, it's state funded. So, although, here's a state funded in California, so let's see what happens next month. Right. right. I, my husband is a faculty member at Humboldt State, and so I'm very familiar with the budget cuts and enrollment cuts and et cetera. So, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting time. Yes? Um, a different question. So, you brought us this exercise, and it's about making a decision whether it's right or wrong. It may be right for me, it might be wrong for the other person, or vice versa. Um, what does that have to do with bullying? Bullying doesn't satisfy, I mean, it might satisfy for the person, but it's not uh, making a decision that they have to do it to make a choice. I didn't see the relationship. So my thought is that the relationship is based on the judgments and assumptions that are in your head, and the consequences of our judgments and our actions that's how bullying can happen. So I don't, I don't believe that people wake up, I am really going to like mess with somebody's day today. I don't think that happens. I don't even think George Bush woke up and was like, how can I kill 100,000 brown people? Like, I believe that he actually thought that going to war in Iraq was the right thing. I believe that to be true. I also don't think he realized all the consequences of that decision. So recognizing the consequences is the connection between genocide and ripping down a flyer. Is that there's consequences and impact on all of these communities. And we have an individual responsibility to interrupt those things, even if it's not illegal. It's just not right. right? There's, there's two quotes that I always blend together, and so I'm not exactly sure what individual quote is which. But one is, is it's always the right time to do the right thing. And it is always the correct thing is to choose the hard right versus the easy wrong. Break that apart. There's two quotes in there, and I think Martin Luther King said one of them, and I don't know which one. But that's how bullying happens. If nine out of ten people have experienced bullying, statistics show that at least eight of those nine have then bullied people back. Because it's internalized behavior that we might not even be aware of. If eight out of nine people are actually bullying back, who's interrupting that behavior? And what I think is interesting is that I think it's everyone. I think eight out of nine people could be bullying back and could also be interrupting the behavior because I don't think our actions are always congruent. So until we know what's happening in our heads and where the positive and negative biases are coming from, we can't even know how congruent our actions are with who we believe we are. That's why it has to happen in here. Does that make sense? Does that help clarify the connection? Yeah. So it's not an ex it's not an external thing. It's it has to happen in here. So I mean, statistically speaking, we should look at ourselves as both bullied and bully, because statistically speaking, everyone except for two and a half people have experienced bullying in this room, and then that would mean everyone but four people have been bullied other people, right? Mm -hmm. so, Can you yes. define the definition of bullying? I, I, don't, I don't know. I can't define bullying because I think it's really subjective. I think anytime you express a sense of power over somebody else, 
because you think it's the right thing to do or you think it's inconsequential, that it can be perceived as bullying. Like, but I, I don't have specific examples. It's, it's when it's not right. Yes? So based on what you're saying, then, it's really about the perception on the part of the recipient. Because people could be bullied and not, well, no, that's not true. It's, it's, it still can be, even if the recipient doesn't. It's both. They're being bullied. <clears throat> Right, it's both. Like some people exert their power and don't, the recipient doesn't necessarily have a kind of neg negative experience with that. Maybe they're used to that kind of experience or maybe they just didn't notice it or maybe they've internalized it or they've silenced those places. Other people don't even, they think that they are living this bully-free, positive, I love everyone, kumbaya life and are actually causing harm to other people. I mean, even like, Martin Luther King would have identified his own work as a bullying kind of step. He said that his view was my his work was myopic in view because he focused so long on only white and black issues because he was scared to bring in other issues. It, he wanted to get his rights first and then come back to other people. That had an impact on women, on gay people, on brown people, on Asian people, on native people. That had an impact on them, and he wasn't paying attention to that. When he began to pay attention, he realized that as he expanded to a living wage, that it actually opened up a conversation across multiple of identities, and that that was more of a right thing to do. Because it wasn't about him getting his rights, it was about doing the right thing. Do you see how that's bigger than that? Mm -hmm. If Martin Luther King would identify his work as bullying, it's hard for me to say, like, when you do this, it is bullying. Because historically, we don't even remember Martin Luther King as a bully. But he would identify that way until he began serving more people outside of his own agenda. So can you hold on just one second? So I want to be really cautious of your time, because I know that y'all are really super stretched. So it's 2.35. I am totally happy to stay in here and keep answering questions, but I want to be mindful of your schedules, and if you need to leave, that's totally good. Oh, I can't read a clock. You yeah, are correct. 135. <laughs> You've been in here. Time warp. <laughs> it is 135. If you need to leave, that is completely fine. Sorry. Time zone. Thank you very much. Oh, you're more than welcome.